Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. Today we have Jeff Rowe with us. Yes, Jeff Rowe, one name. You're the first guest with one name. Uh, he is the awesome. founder at Fobro Web Technology. Interviewed me on his pod. Uh, so I thought I'd re return the favor and interesting guy altogether. He's in Cali. I'm in Mexico. And this pod is presented to you by podpire.com. If you want to start your own podcast, if you want to scale and monetize, go to podpire.com. Jeffro, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Definitely. Well, thanks for having me, Charles. I enjoyed our conversation uh, last time on my show. So I'm looking forward to getting into this. You know, I'm, I run a website company that's actually a digital marketing company, but websites are at the heart of it. And so that's what I love to talk about. Business websites are so important these days. Everybody judges you based on your website. So if you want to get into that, I'd love to get into the details. Yeah, because my websites with an S suck. Um, uh, whether that's charlescormier.com or top leads, I built them on Webflow, some of them and some others with WordPress DV. Uh, WordPress DV has nice templates, just that it's not super quick. Um, so that's yeah. why I got with Webflow, but Webflow sort of lacks the graphic design elements. They have templates, but I don't use them. So um, what's your stack and what do you recommend in terms of uh, having a, a powerful, uh, optimal web presence nowadays? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a couple of layers to that question. But as far as the stack goes, I use WordPress and I use the Elementor page builder. The reason I like WordPress is it's fully flexible. I can customize it any way that I want. I can do any integrations that I want. I can make my own plugins for it if I need to. So I like having that full flexibility. And then Elementor allows me uh, an easy way to have a visually interesting website that's easy to maintain. And that's something I really uh, have gotten a lot of mileage out of because I use it on all my sites. They come with templates and things. If you want a jumping off point, you can just edit them. But they're also really easy to start from scratch. And they have a lot of widgets that help you bring in functionality to make your pages look good and also be functional, whether that's embedding podcast episodes or you know forms, linking those to MailChimp, whatever you have to do. It's all possible and easy. It's a well-known platform. Lots of developers work on it. So if you need help, you can find somebody. And you know it's not going anywhere because it powers, you know, at least a third of the world's websites. But as far as what makes a business website effective, you know, it's more than just picking the right platform. You actually have to start with knowing who your customer is and what you're bringing to the table, because otherwise your messaging isn't going to be right. And if you're just doing what everybody else does and say, oh, I offer XYZ services, call me. Nobody's going to do that, especially these days. They've got so many options. So you got to really stand out. Take the time to figure out what's different about you and make a claim in that headline that lets people know you understand them and what they need, what they care about. And then they're more likely to keep reading and they're more likely to feel like, okay, this is someone I could hire. But even at a basic level, if you haven't taken the time to update your website, it hurts your credibility. We all do this, right? We judge people based on their website. Even if what they offer is totally unrelated to tech, it could be a roof or something. But if they've got a crummy website, we all think twice. And we're probably not going to call them if it looks like, eh, they're probably shady or maybe they don't know what they're doing. But then if you were to talk to them, you might find out, wow, you've been doing this for 30 years. That's amazing. You know, you know all these things. And, and like, like you mentioned, you know, you've got websites, maybe they're okay, right? <laughs> uh, we can always make websites better. But when you start talking to you, you look at your credentials, the things you've accomplished, it like blows me away. And so that's what needs to come through in that website for that first impression. Because a lot of times you don't get a second chance, especially with websites. People just go back to Google, click on the next result, and they forget about you. That's why it's so important. Right. And I guess you can have some lead magnets in there that uh, can draw attention. Uh, are exit pop-ups still a thing? Exit pop-ups are still a thing in some cases. I don't necessarily recommend that everyone use them, but there are certain use cases, like on certain uh, landing pages, especially long-form sales pages, those tend to be helpful. Um, what I've seen, one of the best use cases I've seen for exit pop-ups is, let's say you've got a landing page with a video sales letter. Maybe somebody starts to watch it, or maybe they don't hit the play button, they start to leave. You do the pop-up that says, oh, hey, wait, we actually have a transcript if you prefer to read that instead of watching the video. Click here, right? And that uh, allows 
people to feel heard like, oh yeah, you know, I, I can't play the sound right now anyways. I actually like read, I can read way faster than this video is going to play. So I'd rather do that. And now you've got them in and that's a useful uh, method of the pop-up because it's actually providing them uh, with something they wanted, right? If you're just trying to be self-serving with your pop-ups, that's when they don't work. You always have to offer something of value with your pop-up. You mentioned a lead magnet, right? So on your website, if you want to offer uh, you don't just ask someone, hey, subscribe so you're always up to date. Okay, that used to work. Maybe if it's already a platform people know about, it could work a little bit. But you're going to have a lot more success if you are providing something in exchange for that subscription. So subscribe now and you'll get 10% off your first order. Or subscribe now and I'll send you my free guide on how to make this smoothie. Or whatever you're doing, whatever you're selling, have something of value. So then people are like, all right, yeah, that's worth giving you my email. Uh, and that way it doesn't feel like you're just pestering them. So lead what magnets about, are still uh, uh, Google tag for remarketing? Because if they come on the website and they leave, we, we can remarket them, right? And then what about technology that helps you identify who actually visited your website? This, I think this is trending. Like I can identify that Jeffro has been visiting my website. You can have your email, then I could cold email you. What do you think about these two things? Yeah, I think every website for a business should always have your Google Analytics tracking code on there at a bare minimum. Because even if you don't set up anything custom, at least you can go look at see where people are coming from. Are they coming from uh, the search engines? Are they coming from social media? Were they just referrals from other blogs? Uh, and that's helpful to know, right? But if you want to take that to the next level, like you talked about remarketing, you know, if you're running Google ads or Facebook ads, you can hook that up. And now you can run ads to those people and specifically say to them, hey, thanks for stopping by our website. I noticed you didn't uh, check out XYZ. Here's a, a discount code. Come on back. Whatever you do like that, now you know who you're talking to. And yeah, you get in front of them again. And it makes it a lot more effective because it takes multiple touch points a lot of times when you're selling something for people to really decide that they, you know, they like you, trust you, or, you know, want to learn more. Maybe they're not ready today, but by following up with them over time, you're, you're staying top of mind with your remarketing and uh, uh, that can help a lot. So definitely have that. And there's other ways you can track with even more detail. You know, there's Whoopra, there's uh, Hyros and a lot of other things that get really complicated. So if your business is serious and you're growing and scaling, then you're going to want to look at one of those platforms to get even more granular data to help you make better decisions, especially if you're running across multiple ad platforms, you're going to want to know all that stuff. And I want to talk about your podcast. Um, who has been some of the best guests you had and what did you learn from them? Oh, well, that's a great question. Uh, the podcast is really fun because I do get to meet and talk to a lot of really cool people. Uh, my first guest that I had on the show was Rich Bornstein. He uh, is a video a producer, director, and just, you know, creative guy. He actually worked on... Uh, uh, American Gladiators, the TV show. And uh, he was in the Netflix documentary about the show too. So if you go watch that, you'll see him there. Uh, but yeah, he was on my show. We talked about video storytelling and what it takes to kind of distill someone's brand down to its essence so that you can convey that through a video to someone. Uh, you really need to understand that before you make video content or it's not going to come through, right? It's not going to be clear to the person watching the video who you are, why you're different, why they should care. So you really need to understand that before you start spending all this time and money making content. So he was a really cool one. Um, I've had a few others who are just very uh, good experts in one specific area. So um, we had one where we dove deep on Google Ads. Uh, we've done others where we've talked specifically about um you know lead generation but also demand gen that was an interesting one for me i learned a lot about the differences between demand gen and lead gen specifically uh so if you're interested in learning more about digital marketing yeah go listen to digital dominance and we've got a couple dozen episodes out now uh and i've got a lot more queued up for the coming weeks so how do you get your guests and what's your strategy behind the pod so I get my guests, uh, I kind of curate my guests, right? So I started with my network, people that I know that I've met with over time who really know their stuff, have 
uh, been doing this with success and have something to share that's of value for my audience. So I start by reaching out to the people I know. Uh, and then after that, what I've done is, you know, I also go on other podcasts as guests. Sometimes I'll go through their past guests or, uh, you know, look at their connections on LinkedIn and say, hey, you know, I just had so-and-so on my podcast and I saw that you were on his, you know, uh, he mentioned, he talked really highly of you. I'd love to talk to you about being on my show too. And that's opened a lot of doors. So just reaching out to people through one mutual connection uh, can be really powerful. It's amazing how much relational capital is built through a podcast. But my my goal with the podcast is really to educate service-based business owners about digital marketing and websites, why this is really important and why you can't ignore it anymore. I think a lot of people are trying to just you know focus on the other thing. Oh, I don't like the websites or maybe I don't understand it. It seems like it's too complicated or oh, yeah, I ran a hundred bucks on ads once it didn't work. Like you can't just do that anymore. You, you need a strategy online if you're going to be successful going forward. So that's my main goal with the podcast. And obviously I, I enjoy building up my network uh, by meeting all these additional guests as well. So I'd love to continue to uh, help my listeners expand my network and grow my business through the show as well. Are you looking to monetize it, to have some sponsors at some point? And how do you follow up with guests to make sure that some of them become clients? Great questions. In terms of monetizing, I, I've considered potentially adding an option for guests to upsell and kind of skip the line because I've recorded uh, enough episodes right now. We're recording this in February. I've already got enough episodes to last through the end of July. And so if somebody wants to get the attention of being published sooner, okay, maybe I'll let them jump the line. But I'm never going to let someone pay to just come on my podcast. I always want to curate uh, and give permission and only invite certain people on the show. Uh, because that otherwise, it's not fair to my listeners. If just the people who have money can be on the show, I, I want to make sure that they have something to offer. Uh, but in, as a as far as monetizing from the listener's side, I always offer a way for them to connect with me because if I teach them something, they go do it themselves, great, I'm happy. If they don't want to do it on their own, they want to have me do it for them, great, I'm happy. And at the end of every show, I uh, share a link, frobro.com slash dominate. So if you want help looking at your online presence or your website, I'll go do that for free. I'll do a quick assessment, send you a video and say, here's what I think you should do. And it's up to you what to do after that. You could either hire me, you could do it yourself, or, uh, you know, it's up to you. But I always want to keep that door open. Right. And um, sponsoring, do you think, for example, that you could do some hosting provider that you're with? You could drop a link in there and they could you could get some affiliate uh, monetization channel from that? Yeah, I do have a couple episodes where my guest has given me an affiliate link to post in the show notes. So Hyros is one example. They have you know a very detailed analytics and tracking platform. Uh, so I shared a, an affiliate link for that episode. It actually hasn't come out yet, but um, so that's one example. Most of the episodes, though, I I position it as being brought to you by Frobro, which is my company, because I already do offer hosting, domains, maintenance, SEO. And so I want to be that first point of contact for my listeners. And most of the time, you know, a listener, if they're learning something from me, they feel comfortable with me and they want to work with me as opposed to going and finding someone else who now they're not sure if that person knows what they're doing or if they're just saying it. So um, I kind of, at this point in time, I'm going to stick with Frobro as the one, the main sponsor. There's various AI tools to build websites. I've tried a couple of these. Uh, they're somewhat good for quick presentations, but how uh, how much time are we away from having these AI tools that can build like a really complete website about myself that would scrape my LinkedIn, all my content, and I would tell it like, yo, build a website for this purpose, and they would do it in seconds. Uh, does that exist? So there are AI tools. I've toyed with some of them. I, I have one right now that I'm comfortable using for a starter website. So if someone comes to me and says, I don't have a big budget. I just need something up, you know, for 500 bucks, I'll run it through the AI tool. Here's a website. It's a starting point. But if you want something good, that's going to be a lot more effective from a business and conversion standpoint, 
right now it needs a human touch. You know, you need a professional copywriter who's going to take the time to understand you, who's going to understand your clients and figure out how to craft that messaging, right? And then we get a custom design around it so it doesn't look as templated. And then we do the integrations, right, with your CRM or other platforms, ad tracking, all of this. So that's all going to take human touch right now. Uh, in the future, it's possible that we'll start getting closer to that. But it's the difference of, you know, me charging 500 bucks for an AI built quick ready website, I still have to ask you a few questions, right? I got to know something about your business. Um, and, and even if I say, okay, go scrape this person's LinkedIn, it still depends on you spending some time putting that information up there. And it's never going to fully capture your personality or brand because it, it can't, at least at this stage, it, it's not good enough or sophisticated enough to recreate an individual's personality through a website. So that's that's the biggest difference right now. Is yes, it'll spit out a template with some words that you know you can provide it about the services you offer, but it's of course don't expect that to be the ultimate answer for your website. You know you should be spending five, six, seven thousand dollars for a professional uh, business website, and that's not even if you're doing e-commerce, it's going to be even more, right? So that's for a service-based business, and that's because of all the work that goes into it, with that goal in mind of converting a visitor to a potential customer. How much uh, clients do you run on usually? Like what's the roster size and how do you acquire these clients usually? Uh, it varies depending on the month. Um, I have my hosting and maintenance clients. Obviously that goes up over time. M most of them just stay with me. So we're in the dozens at this point. I've got a handful of SEO clients as well. That one goes up a little more slowly. Usually what happens is when I do a web design project, they then become a hosting and maintenance client. So right now uh, I've got about a 10 or 12 active website projects going on of varying scale and scope. Some of them include custom development uh, for like a, basically its own WordPress tool uh, that the person is going to monetize and sell. Others are just kind of, you know, functionality issues. Oh, they created a quiz in Gravity Forms and it doesn't do what they want. So I've got to go in and fix it for them. Um, and some of them are complete web design from scratch, right? You know, maybe they had a GoDaddy template and it was terrible. And so they're hiring me to do it right. Does that answer the question? Yeah, uh, but Still not clear on like your main channel, like Facebook ads, cold outreach, oh, right. LinkedIn outreach. Yeah, how I get my clients. So uh, it's a combination of factors. I've gotten a lot of business through networking and uh, referrals just because I do a good job and people tell other people. So that's kind of how I got started was through a lot of online networking events. H7 is a great networking platform. Uh, and that one, I, I recommend everybody check it out. Uh, and then the podcast has helped get me additional visibility and help position me more as an authority so people know about me they are comfortable hiring me and i last year i did a paid campaign um which started working well i got some clients out of it but i had some fulfillment issues on the back end so i had to pause that one but i've done i like trying things before i recommend it to my clients so i've done paid facebook ads i've done paid google ads i've done cold email uh, i've done contact form automation which uh, I, I don't like that for a number of reasons. I ended up on a lot of subscription lists because of that. Uh, so there's interesting things like that. You know, I've done automation on LinkedIn as well, which has gotten me business. But for the moment, I've decided to pause that because it's been hard to, uh, again, like we talked about with AI, it doesn't fully authentically represent me, you know, when, when I'm reaching out to somebody and it's kind of this little stilted message. And they're like, eh, that doesn't really feel right. So... To answer your question, is it's a little of everything right now. So, what are your top goals for this year? Top goals are to um, expand my client base. I know that's a wide uh, answer, but I I want to do a lot more web projects, um, and I'm plan to expand my team as well. So. Uh, as the podcast grows, as I get more listeners and followers, uh, and they want to do their websites with me, I'm going to need to expand my team because I can't keep up with everything myself. I do have an SEO team right now. I've got copywriters, I've got graphic designers, uh, but I am going to be working on my own internal SOPs to make sure I've standardized all the procedures we need to do for a website, any standards that I have for quality and timelines. Uh, that those are things I need to define this year, and I plan to work on that a lot more. 
Where can people find out more about you, Jeffro? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search for Jeffro. You can connect with me. Or if you go to frobro.com, you can learn all about my company, about me. On the About page, you'll learn about my hair and how I got a fro and my nickname and all of that. Uh, but you can uh, also find the podcast through the website, or you can go directly to digitaldominancepodcast.com. And those are all ways you can find me.